All right, let's uh, get started. Uh, welcome everyone from now until 1.30 Central Time. Uh, we're gonna have this uh, interactive uh, bioinformatic educational panel. And uh, we're very pleased to have um, three colleagues of mine who are really distinguished in their own uh, uh, field. And they're uh, really the frontline uh, professors working to educate students interested in bioinformatics from high school level uh, through the bachelor degree, master degree, uh, graduate and the postdocs. So we're having a really wide variety of people to train and then this will make a very interesting discussion. The way I'm going to structure this is that uh, I will start with uh, each of the uh, panelists and give them the chance to talk using some slides about uh, a topic of interest they pick within bioinformatics education. And especially we're yielding to Dr. Philip Campbell uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, who is a special guest to the region, not only because he's uh, geographically far away from us, from a very prestigious uh, university program, but also because that uh, many of us know <clears throat> him through the book uh, with Pavel Presna, uh, Bioinformatics Algorithm. Uh, he has truly made a tremendous impact. And so we're dedicating uh, 10, 15 minutes to him. Uh, and hopefully he will share with us some unique perspective. And after that, it will be followed by Dr. Chindo Hicks from Louisiana State University uh, talk about his experience uh, educating people maybe in the master uh, program. And then follow, um, following uh, Chindo, we'll have a uh, Dr. Elliot Lefkowicz, uh, who is a CCPS Pro a Bioinformatics Director and also the newly founded the bachelor degree program here uh, at UAB in bioinformatics. And he's gonna talk about the new exciting opportunity. Uh, and then uh, I will conclude uh, with a short, uh, just a verbal uh, message on the PhD program options and the post PhD training opportunity here at UAB. And then uh, we hope to compress our session of the talk briefly so that we'll leave plenty of time for discussions. I will only have one slide that has some uh, predefined questions. And I would urge people in the audience to use the chat box and type in the question that you're interested in as you actually uh, may have generated them throughout the presentation. So with that, uh, Philip, go ahead and see if you can share uh, your desktop. Okay, Jake, thank you so much for the warm introduction. I'll try to share screen here. I'll just assume that, <clears throat> excuse me, ex assume that everybody can see it starting now. Um, so let me know if there's any issue with that. I'm looking forward to hearing everybody else's talk too. It's, it's exciting to be able to do this. And honestly, with without the pandemic, I probably couldn't have done a weekday uh, meeting uh, flying across the country with, with teaching requirements. Um, so it's, it's great to be able to join you and, and thanks again. Um, so, I'm an associate teaching professor at, at Carnegie Mellon in our computational biology department. Um, and the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about some of our education. Now that's a, a big picture thing because we're one of seven departments in our um, School of Computer Science. This is our home uh, shown Gates Tillman Center for um, the, the seven departments within SCS. And it's now grown to multiple buildings and, and kind of I've got the view of, of part of it as my background as well. Um, and so we actually have a, a full suite of educational programs. We have a, a Lane Fellows postdoc program too, I guess that's, that's not mentioned here, but in terms of educational programs, we educate students from the high school level to the PhD level. So we have a pre-college program, an undergrad program, two master's programs. One is in computational biology, the other is in automated science. So we were fortunate enough to, to recently construct a fully automated laboratory um, that students use that there's a lot of um, sort of active learning 
uh, closed loop experimentation that they do, along with getting machine learning courses and the programming courses and computational biology courses to train them to be automated scientists. Um, and then we have a PhD program as well, which is joint with the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I have, have worn different hats with, with some of these programs, but the two that I have the most involvement with currently are the undergrad program where I'm the, the program director and our high school program where I'm a co-director with, with Dr. Josh Kangas. So I thought I'd speak a little bit about those. Um, I know the organizers wanted me to say a little about our department in general. Um, and from you know, a big picture, we, we feel like we're in a unique position because we're in a computer science school. So we're trained, we can really train students as very strongly computationally minded people. Um, and that's very much the case with our undergrad program as well. That's us on free sunglass day at one of our um, hangouts back before the pandemic. Um, and I thought I'd just kind of give a brief overview of what makes us, I think, somewhat unique. So we're in, because we're in the School of Computer Science, undergrads actually apply to the School of Computer Science. And that's, depending on the year, sometimes the most prestigious, uh, most selective institution in the country um, or very close to it. So there's about a 5% acceptance rate of students who apply. Um, five to 10, it kind of can vary. Um, and so we're turning down many very capable students um, presumably who are out there, unfortunately, that we don't get to see. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you look at traditional metrics, we're moving away from the SAT, but, you know, traditionally it's been like a 1550 median SAT, which outperforms, uh, pretty much every other institution, um, and by any other metric as well. So how we have set up our major is to leverage that benefit of having extremely talented quantitative students who are also very well-rounded. So our, our students as computer scientists come in, for example, and they take a proofs-based mathematics course in their first semester, which would be extremely rare even for a mathematics major. Um, but now we can train computational biologists assuming they've taken a course like that. And they take a very rigorous core of quantitative and computer science coursework that's um, almost identical to what other students take in other majors. We have four majors currently, the others being computer science, artificial intelligence, and human computer interaction. Um, and then the comp bio course sits at what we think is really the middle of all this coursework. So when we teach a genomics course, for example, as a junior level course, it assumes the students have already done several math courses, including probability and statistics, including proofs, that they're two years into a CS curriculum and that they've taken an intro to ML course as well as already seen a comp bio course and taken some biology core coursework too. Um, so it, it makes us distinct in terms of how heavily we can train students especially starting in their first year. So we have um, a first year course called Great Ideas in Computational Biology that I teach in the spring. That's a second semester course for undergrads that teaches some very, very deep topics. Um, about half the topics are from genomics and half the topics are about, uh, you know, from other areas of computational biology. We try to take a broad view. Um, students complete their own project. They do dozens of programming assignments. So because we know they've already had at least one programming course, sometimes two. Um, and so uh, it's a very kind of deep course, but it's, it's great because students have many have not seen comp bio at all before, and we can start getting them interested in it in their first year. We also have an additional major program that's kind of open to all of our CMU students, um, which is a good fit for, say, a student who knows they still want to do CS, but they're interested in bio or they want to do biology, which is in a separate college, but they want to add comp bio on top of it. So we have students from kind of a few different majors in that. Um, a students just need a 3.0 uh, GPA in order to qualify for that. And then we have a minor in concentration as well, the minor being for students outside of our computer science school, um, and then a concentration for students within our computer science school that's more a little more computationally heavy. It kind of assumes that students have done some prerequisite computational and, and actually a compiled course before they can declare that. One of the special things about our, our undergrad major is that we actually guarantee research to all majors. I don't think that there's any other major in the country that has such a pledge, um, although uh, I may be wrong at, at this moment in time, but when we looked, we, it's not something that we really could find on an individual major level. Um, so all of our students get at least one semester of one-on-one -on -one research with the professor. And that's the nice thing of being in a relatively small computer science school. We only have about 10 comp bio majors per year. So it's something that we can manage. And actually we, we instituted it because so many of our students were coming in as high school prospective students asking us about research opportunities, which we know that places with a thousand CS majors simply can't promise. 
Um, our professors are really happy about that too because they know how strong our students are. Um, we love getting connect, connecting alums and companies to students. So we hold our own kind of in-house industry events, or if we have, this was at our, the 10th year uh, anniversary celebration of our department, we bring in alums and they talk to current students about what they do and, and the opportunities for studying or taking their studies in comp bio and, and taking them downstream. And then I showed the sunglass photo, but we try to have fun with all of our students. And this is across all of our our uh, academic programs, even though we're in Pittsburgh and it gets cold in the winter, we'll do things like take them snow tubing to um, to a local park and so on. And we have departmental pledges that you know will we'll provide funds for this sort of thing, which is really good for cohort building. Um, and then I wanted to talk just very briefly again about our um, our high school program. So we have a a pre college program that's one of CMU has a, a central program that's uh, and now grown to about eleven programs um in all different sorts of things so four of them are on computational tasks but there's architecture and design and drama the very famous drama program uh, that's gone on for many years and we added comp bio to this to this mix so we have a, a program for typically rising juniors and seniors in high school it's a three-week typically in-person program although for the for last year and this year, we run the program fully online and actually doubled the size of the program. So we normally had 25, but we're now we've now grown to 50. And we could probably, we had to turn away many, many capable people. So we're very happy with how that's grown. Um, we have some kind of big picture goals of, of what students do in this. We want them to have fun first and foremost. So we don't have required homework, for example. They have a, uh, and when we're in person, they have an eight hour day. When we're remote, they have a four hour day. And the it's very a very challenging thing um, that students come in and work together on problems, but then we don't overwork them. We don't assign a grade. We want them to be able to then have fun when they leave as well as while they're in the classroom. Um, and many of them simply have not seen uh, either the programming language that we currently use, which is Go, although we may switch that. So as well as anything computational in biology, they may have taken AP computer science, they may have taken AP bio, and they have no idea that there even is an intersection. So it's good to get to, to train really uh, smart students in this, in this regard. What do we do? So we, we have two main top, topics biologically. Um, we started the program as a Three Rivers of Pittsburgh microbiome project and transition to add topics related to SARS-CoV-2 as we were forced online. So we look at bacterial and viral data sets heavily with a heavy genomics focus. We actually take students when we can do it. We take students out on the Pittsburgh Three Rivers and do about a 40 mile trip with them where they capture different samples at different points, um, extract the DNA. And then there's a, a lab component when we're in person as well, where they actually carry out sequencing steps and, and so on and go through the, the lab pipeline in order to capture data, which we then turn around and analyze. Um, so a big part of this is making sure that we have an active learning classroom. When we're in a lab, that's a kind of active learning by design. The students are always doing things. But even if we're teaching by a Zoom, um, we know the research that says that people learn better when they're doing something as opposed to just listening some, to something. Um, and so we try to build that in as much as we can. So we subdivide students into what we call, we have a bacterial focus, so we call them colonies and we let them come up with their own logo and, and name and so on. But we have small groups of four or five students and they are constantly working like in pods to solve problems. So we actually, when we're uh, online, they can interact via Zoom, breakout rooms, plus Discord. They have like one uh, coding window that everybody can see. And so we're giving them dozens of uh, challenges one at a time where they learn a little bit and then they're asked to code something together. And the TAs can all see like three different screens, three different windows of the students coding in real time. And then the professors can pop in and do that. So really over half of the time that we spend even though it's it's a course on teaching them computational biology, it's them actually doing things like writing an algorithm and then applying it to solve a problem on real data. And what's amazing about that is we don't actually even require our students to come in with any programming background. We give them a boot camp before they arrive. And so some of them have never coded six weeks previously. And now all of a sudden they're able to to write code together to solve some real problem. Um, I thought I would explain like what are the big picture things that we do we start with with metagenomics and that's a big problem that we would we would do if we capture the DNA from say the rivers. Um, you know, how is it that the bacteria are changing over time, can we quantify that can we look at metrics of alpha diversity beta diversity more complicated things like producing a PCOA plot 
the types of things that standard pipelines do, but we actually ask students to before they just use the pipeline. It's not hard to teach students how to implement, say, jacquard distance. And so we can start with something that's actually quite simple there. Um, then we, we look at, at things like, well, if we have all the data from, say, the river, we can look at sequence alignment algorithms to compare, you know, how is it that BLAST really works or what, what is it based upon? What are the simpler ideas that it's based upon? So, you know, the next thing you know, we have students writing an algorithm, say, for local alignment. Um, and, and connecting that to doing a database comparison and seeing how the data that they've captured as well as other students over different seasons, how do they vary river to river or season to season, those sorts of things. Um, we actually then build a, a genome uh, assembler with our students. Um, it's a simplified version of a genome assembler. It's not exactly industry grade, but it comes out with some pretty good results and some reasonably reliable contexts, um, which is cool. And then we have applied that to Bacterial genome gets quite messy, but it does a pretty good job of reconstructing SARS-CoV-2's genome, which was cool to see. Um, we then ask, it's kind of the standard question. So the whole point of the, our program is to replicate a real research project. We want to treat our students as, as scientific equals, because we think if we give them that respect, you know, they will respond great to it, which they really have. Um, and so we want to like truly replicate a scientific process of they're going to be out in the lab, they understand the experimental design, then they learn about how all this stuff works for um, for for analyzing the data that they that they themselves gather. And so the next thing we would do, for example, if we assemble a single genome is annotate it and find its genes. So um, we can write a simple gene finder, for example, that finds all the um, all of the known genes within the SARS-CoV-2 genome, since it only has about 10. Um, and then we talk about, you know, the process of comparing against an existing database, et cetera. And then, of course, we do evolutionary tree algorithms and connect that both to viral data sets as well as the bacterial data sets that students have gathered. Um, and so students can implement a, an evolution, evolutionary tree algorithm. The, the specific thing that they did last year was <clears throat> they, um, they, looked, they actually replicated this result, which was in the news, that the early American uh, coronavirus cases clustered closer to Italian cases than they did to Chinese cases. So we gave the students the data and we gave them something on how they would plot this in R and then they just did it and it was quite impressive. Um, this year we're actually going to use the opportunity of having multiple variants of coronavirus so students can actually see how that is spreading around the world and changing as it goes. Um, so that's the, I guess, the benefit of being in a fluid environment, so to speak, is that we have to constantly change our curriculum. So it's a lot of work, but very rewarding. Um, I, I have some quotes here. I think I'm going to be a little over time if I show them. So I, the, the students tend to really report very positively on this program. Um, they speak to say, not having any clue that biology could be used in the sense they just thought the programming was Google because they don't get that exposure in school, um, that you know the problems that they can solve are new, incredibly important relevant to modern life, um, that they can work on problems together, that programming isn't this thing that you're just someone chained to a computer at a desk solving a problem alone, that it can be a, a joint thing, um, that you can get something that's challenging and that can be a wonderful thing, that you're not worried about a grade. So all of a sudden you're just interested in the problem scientifically and computationally and that you can embrace this challenge. Um, and then we, had, we actually have several scholarships per year as well um, and we, when we create our colonies, we make sure that they're geographically diverse, diverse on gender, diverse on, in terms of ethnicity, that sort of thing. And we had a student who was interviewed by a separate thing, and they actually noticed that we had done this. We didn't tell the students that we had done this, um, but she talked about how awesome it was that everybody on our team was different. They had a different background, a different, uh, came from different areas and so on. So that's it. I don't want to take up any more time. I, I can't wait to hear other, everybody else's um, everybody else's uh, talks, but I'd be happy to answer any kind of questions on any of this sort of thing. Um, I'm easy to find and then we can we can have a chat later. All right, well, uh, let's go for uh, Chindo. All right, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Chindo Hicks. I'm here at the LISU um, Medical Center in New Orleans. So we, uh, we have developed a new program uh, called the uh, MS, Biomedical Sciences, Bioinformatics track uh, under the School of uh, Graduate Studies. 
Uh, it's a two-year program uh, that uh, uh, constitutes uh, courses. Uh, it consists of courses on the uh, a thesis. So basically the students take the courses, but they also have a thesis as part of the uh, co-program. Co uh, the students see uh, uh, basically, they take uh, courses uh, in uh, genetics, molecular biology, uh, statistics, uh, bioinformatics programming, computational genomics, and the uh, advanced bioinformatics. Uh, before we started this program, we started first with the summer program, uh, summer program in bioinformatics that basically allows us to uh, allowed us to create a foundation from which we can recruit those uh, potential bioinformatics uh, students. So that's uh, how we are set up. Uh, and in the interest of time, I probably just list some few things that uh, I would like uh, to uh, hear from the other members of the panel and the, uh, the other participants. So we are located here in the South, as you know, New Orleans. Uh, that means uh, we take a lot of students from more historically black colleges and the uh, uh, HBCUs, uh, historically black colleges and universities. Uh, one of the challenges that I, we faced here is that uh, uh, the students, even though they have the potential to take bioinformatics, but they don't know where to go after that. They say, if I take bioinformatics, where do I go after that? So I'm sure uh, uh, Jake will probably uh, give some light or shine some light on that. Uh, the other part is, uh, this is a degree program that is designed if, uh, to either prepare the students to go to industry or in academia or to go to a PhD program. Uh, we have a very small program here uh, at LSU. We don't have undergraduate baseline. Uh, so that means that uh, I have to look elsewhere. Uh, in this case, probably looking more towards the UAB. Uh, where my students can go if they need to go to uh, a PhD program. Uh, then the other thing I would like you guys to touch about is the career pathways. Uh, it's like, uh, okay, if I do bioinformatics, uh, what can I do and all of that? As you know, there's not very much a big industry for bioinformatics in the South uh, and therefore students are left uh, kind of wondering. Uh, I would like to know a little bit also about internships where can students go to have some kind of exposure. Uh, and then of course, I would like to know how you guys are funding your bioinformatics uh, programs. Maybe Philip there can also shed some light on that. So I think I'll stop there in the interest of time. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, now, Elliot, would you like to share some slides or make some comments about undergraduate education here. Sure, I'll share a few slides here. There we go. Okay, so um, I'm gonna concentrate on the undergraduate bioinformatics program at UAV. Um, unlike I think the, the programs Philip was talking about, ours is relatively new. Um, we're two years old in essence, um, and this coming fall, we'll be accepting our third class of students. Um, and uh, my co-director in this program is John Johnstone, who's the associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. I'm in the Department of Microbiology. And together, where we direct the undergraduate program, of course, the most important person in any undergraduate program is the academic advisor and Courtney White, who we share with computer science um, is the academic advisor for the bioinformatics program. So as I said, the bioinformatics program was developed a couple of years ago to provide undergraduate students who are interested in both bioinformatics and computer science um, and biology, um, the ability to take a more intensive program that focuses on developing the skills that they need to do bioinformatics and to go on from here, whether or not it's, it's actually doing bioinformatics in a pharmaceutical firm or if they're going on for an advanced degree. And so as you can imagine, the program focuses um, initially in the first couple of years on getting their biology prerequisites. So they have the background in genetics, genomics and biostatistics. 
Um, also in those first couple years, they get their basic computer science classes. That gives them uh, basic programming, uh, graph theory, algorithms, data structures. And so that really forms the basis in addition to their uh, chemistry, physics, and math classes for continuing on in their later years as a junior and senior to take their um, advanced bioinformatic classes. Um, as, as, as you just heard, I said, starting those as a junior and senior. So one thing that we thought was important since they aren't taking any bioinformatics classes um, in their freshman and sophomore year to give them an introduction to bioinformatics in those um, years. So I teach a bioinformatics seminar class where the students come in and we have sort of informal presentations and discussions on current topics in bioinformatics, whatever they may be. Um, and those have, I think, have been very successful. You can see here an example of the bioinformatics classes that they do take, um, whether it be an introduction, um, an algorithms class, data management, um, next generation sequencing, visual analytics. Given that this is a new program, um, I think that portfolio of classes will change and grow over the years, especially as faculty at UAB um, decide that they'd like to have a, a little bit of a spin in the undergraduate classes and teach a little bit. And so I think we'll expand those a good bit. Uh, an extremely important component to the program, a requirement for graduation is to do research in a lab. Um, the bioinformatics-based research certainly can be done in any lab at UAB, though the concentration of faculty who would generally be hosting students is, is more in the School of Medicine than anywhere else. And so they have to spend at least a semester and more than likely a couple semesters um, will be spent doing research in a lab. If you look at our current students, as I indicated uh, on the program is coming up on three years, we have our first student graduating this spring, um, students that are um, sophomores or, or juniors are gonna become seniors. We have five students. We have five students who entered last year. And right now I'm pleased to say that it looks as though our new class coming in this fall will be at least 19 students. So the program has really grown over the years. Um, it, 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 interesting too, if you were to ask, if I were to ask you, what percentage of all current students are um, female versus male? What would you say? Give me one person, shout out. What's the percentage of female versus male? What would you think? I'm not gonna go on unless someone guesses. So someone guess. 80, 20 female, Elliot. 90% female. Yeah. So close. Um, which surprised me, Philip, apparently it doesn't surprise you that much from your experience. I just got our prospective contact list for admitted students. I don't want to take your time, but I just got it. No, no. And it was like, it's actually an issue to me. I, I want our, our program to have more gender parity. I mean, it was just be horrible if it was the other way. And it's an amazing thing at one side, but then it's like, now we need to reach out to more men. Yeah, and you know, I, I'm pleased with the breakdown. Yes, it would be nice to have more gender parity, but given that so many STEM um, uh, programs have just the opposite, I think we could do with um, uh, having a, a weight towards uh, females. Um, I, I did, we, we did have a few additional male students originally, and they decided to switch more into computer science. And so they weren't as interested in the biology end of things. Whether that is what's guiding um, this ratio right now, I don't know. So I do want to mention that we also have a, a master's degree program as part of our um, multidisciplinary biomedical science program. Importantly for the undergraduate students, we have an accelerated bachelor's master's program. And so that accelerated program allows the bachelor's students to, in essence, at the same time, get a master's. And if they're, you know, um, really um, concentrating on it, they could do that in four years, um, or, you know, it might take five years, but they can share credits between the, the master's level with their requirements for the bachelor's level programs. And um, please contact me 
Um, if you would like more information, I'd be happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Um, I should also mention to end up that the bachelor's program is one of a group of, I think now five separate joint science programs between the School of Medicine at UAB and the UAB College of Arts and Sciences. And so those programs include immunology, genetics, neuroscience, cancer biology. So these are specialty programs that allow undergraduate students to take advantage of School of Medi Medicine faculty, School of Medicine research opportunities to use that for their, their bachelor's degree program. So I'll stop there. Thank you, uh, Elliot. Thank you. <clears throat> um, now I'm gonna share uh, one slide uh, to talk, continue to talk about bioinformatics uh, education, but uh, from the UAB uh, graduate program perspective. Uh, at the Informatic Institute, we have a page on education. If you follow the link, uh, and you can navigate to the page and get to some of the slightly uh, outdated information, but about both undergraduate and graduate program. Uh, for someone who uh, are interested in the UAB's graduate program, I'm listing three that's uh, related. The first one is a PhD in General Biological Sciences, GBS, uh, and the theme is uh, genetics, genomics, and bioinformatics. And this program is especially suitable for students coming in from a pure biology life science background uh, with uh, very little computing uh, background. Uh, if you pass through a summer course, which is uh, uh, taught by uh, Malay and uh, Alex, who have presented earlier today, um, it's called the 510. Uh, programming with biological data. If you succeed with it, then usually we generally believe that uh, you're suitable. Uh, a student in this program generally spend the first year on a various uh, biology core courses at the graduate level. Uh, but then the, from second year on, there will be plenty of opportunity to take uh, bioinformatics courses um, and uh, other courses related to the domain. And another program is actually brand new. It's a PhD in biomedical engineering in collaboration with the School of Engineering. Uh, starting the fall next year, we'll be enrolling students. But the uh, special about this program is that uh, people coming from a more pragmatic uh, background with programming skills, with some experience in engineering can get started uh, by bypassing a lot of the uh, bio courses, but focusing on machine learning, focusing on simulations and algorithms. And so this is a really a program for a different type of uh, a student with a different background. And so we're looking forward to receiving some application to it. In addition, we're also collaborating with the computer science and they have uh, well-established the master program in data science or computer science. In the case of data science master program, they also have a track called the bioinformatics track. It's only one and a half year and it's a course only. Uh, upon graduation, some of the students can actually go into the industry. Some of them actually go into research lab to become um, maybe research uh, yeah, programmers, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, but then they also have PhD program and their PhD program tend to be small. So I advise anyone interested in their program, which more focusing on biocomputing techniques, select the faculty doing research in bioinformatics ahead of the time. And then uh, you need to ensure that, that there's a faculty who is accepting you into the uh, research lab before maybe uh, their program can accept you. In addition, throughout the uh, graduate uh, uh, career, there are parallel activities that really enhance the formal curricular training. So one of them is run by uh, Dr. Amy Wang called the Bioinformatics Power Talk Series. 
almost every other Fridays in spring and fall semester year round, we're inviting people from all over the country. Now it, uh, it's easy, so we can have people like Phillips from uh, far away, very prestigious institution to uh, give us lectures about um, their active research project. Also, uh, every summer in the past two years, and perhaps uh, this year as well, uh, Julai Wang and Dr. Amy Wang, myself, we've been organizing data science hackathons. And this is for uh, graduate students in any program to actually uh, practice a little bit of a data science skills. And each year we pick a theme. Uh, last year we pick a theme of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this year, if we're gonna run it, uh, probably it's gonna be cancer. And then there will be price associated. Uh, so what data uh, science hackathon is, uh, is that, that we provide the infrastructure such as Ubride, and then we get everyone together to form teams highly interdisciplinary teams from biology, clinical medicine, computer science, engineering, to solve very specific problem in two days. So it will be exciting. And uh, I think uh, let me just stop here and uh, convene my panel for interactive session. So as we're going into the interaction sessions, I really encourage everyone, as I said earlier, to uh, put down your questions uh, into the chat box. So this way, if it's uh, something that we can incorporate during our discussions, um, it would be uh, nicely done. Um, Jake, let me say, I have to apologize. In about 15 minutes, I'm gonna bow out to teach the very bioinformatics seminar I mentioned uh, for the undergraduate students. Yeah, well, no apology. Thank you for squeeze, uh, making time even <laughs> before you're teaching. All right, um, so um, I'm gonna actually start asking the panelists. So I'm wearing a student hat and uh, maybe looking into getting into the field of bioinformatics. I'm seeing a lot of the words. Um, I don't know what they are. Some people say, well, quantitative biology is uh, the future because biology is maybe experimental. Uh, well, all of you here are saying bioinformatics. I hear other university may have mentioned other terms, uh, more traditionally computational biology, uh, or more trendy about medical data science, or in more traditional about eng engineering biostatistics. What should I choose? Uh, maybe we can start with Philip. I would say we should all relabel our programs AI for life sciences, something like this. And then we can multiply our students by 10. <laughs> no, but um, in all seriousness, it's, it is a tricky one, right? I mean, quantitative biology to me sometimes feels like mathematicians who are working on biologically inspired mathematics questions. I think that may have changed a bit. Um, maybe that's more historically the case. Um, biomedical data science is a tricky one. I know we deal with bio versus bioinformatics all the time. And I think bioinformatics tends to be more of a term that's more often used um, and we try to at least try to think of computational biology as more algorithmic in focus, you know, developing tools versus understanding and using tools. Um, but I don't know if, if others would have that, that kind of view. I also think bioinformatics can be heavily genomics focused and computational biology is, is very much not necessarily that it could be really any aspect of computation applied to, to biology, but that may be just my own biased thought. Yeah. I mean, I would say from a prospective student standpoint, the first thing they have to do is look at how these terms are defined by the particular programs they're interested in, because I think each program is going to define these differently. Basically, you know, when I first talk to the st a student, any student, whether they're going into a, a bachelor's program or a PhD program or whatever, you always talk about this continuum from the card hardcore computer science end of things 
to the biological end of things. And as Philip indicated, the hardcore computer science, which may include computational biology, is more the development of the algorithms and the development of the tools that others like bioinformaticians who are more towards the biology end of the spectrum use to analyze their data. But that's, that's very general. And again, how any particular program defines it and decides what to include in their curriculum is gonna be very much specific to that program. Yeah, I think I totally agree with the, that vision because I think just looking at the title, or the theme of the program may not be sufficient for a student to decide. Uh, it may well be that the student wants to see at the structure of the curriculum and what they want to do. For example, uh, there may be students who just want to, to, to learn applied bioinformatics that they can apply for their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and then there may be other students who are not interested in that. They are more interested in algorithm development. For example, uh, gene structure prediction and things like that uh, may be uh, in the area of computational biology, while the other applications may be uh, more related to just uh, applied uh, bioinformatics. Okay. Well, I, I, I think I completely agree. It seems that uh, you cannot judge the, the content by the label itself. And a lot of the work that the individual sh student should do is to get in touch with people like us and talk about what the students are expected in each of the program to see whether that's the right fit. And sometimes the, the most painful thing to do is to get into a program and only to find out this is not what you truly like. And uh, then uh, that will be uh, frustrating for everyone. Um, now, uh, I also want to uh, just uh, extend the question into the next one. Um, so as a student, um, I may be very curious and I look at some of the, uh, the great bioinformaticians looking at their CVs and somehow some bioinformatician seems to come out of nowhere. And from theoretical biophysics, like Chris Sender and uh, doing physics work, having PhD in molecular biology and physics, and then become one of the, uh, the, the founding fathers of computational biology. When you look at the, some of the more translational people, they come from medicine, computer science, but not in bioinformatics. So as a student, I could be confused. And should I actually just do what I, what I do uh, in an excellent way and uh, don't necessarily go into a formal training in bioinformatics and get a good job in this field? What, what do people think? Well, I guess maybe I think you can start talking about your own experience. <laughs> I think it depends on what you call formal training. So to do bioinformatics in whatever situation you're going into, whether it be government, pharmaceutical firm, um, academics, research, whatever, you do need some background and let, let's call it the, the computational biological sciences. Um, you have to have shown that you have training, irrespective of how you got that training, sufficient to allow you to do the work in that field. Before, I mean, you know, these are new fields. And so 25 years ago, there was no formal training in any of these. So we all came into it from a strictly biology background or maybe computer science or engineering or physics, whatever. And, and we were able to get into it without having that card in our wallet that said bioinformatician or computational biologist. I think that has changed a bit such that, you know, th there is some expectation that you have some training. It doesn't have to be formal training. Maybe you talked a guy into working in their lab and you ended up doing all the, the genomics processing, all the analytics that they needed. And you learned enough such that you could go elsewhere and use those same techniques and that's fine, but you do have to get training somehow. And a lot of times the easiest way to do that is to go through a formal program, but it doesn't have to be. 
And I would say, I just add to that in, in two directions. It, formal training in bioinformatics is, is often necessary just to get more training in, in bioinformatics or some type of experience. So I'm just, I'm not on our PhD committee, but we have hunt, like 400 plus applications and wind up with 11 students. Um, and I mean, a lot of that is they're selecting students based off of prior research. I mean, they're, they're looking for people who have already made a transition or either have the formal training in it or have done real work in order to even do a PhD in comp bio. I don't think 10 years ago that was the case at all. Like it was just anyone who was interested who could demonstrate that they're quantitatively strong and that they want to make this transition could do it. But the expectation now at the PhD level is that in many cases you already need to have started. The other thing I would add is we, we have these industry uh, seminar series talks and the, the surprising thing I hear from a lot of people when students ask them questions over and over again is that they they get really tired of, of reviewing CVs in industry of people who are poor fits and who don't have requisite training. On the one side of the spectrum, a biologist who started a, a code academy thing six weeks ago and is, try, is admirably learning how to code and has a great biological foundation, but very little computational depth all the way over to somebody who's applied to Facebook and Uber and big tech firms and thought, oh, I'll apply to this too, and has like no biology background since high school. And they need people who have the intersection and, and who have depth in both of these areas. And a lot of times they, they struggle to find it um, when we talk to people who are out there. Excellent common. Chindo, do you have any? Uh, yeah, so uh, just a little bit to add to that. I, I think uh, that again depends on uh, what the background of a student is. For example, you may have a student who is a pure computer science person, but wants to go into uh, bioinformatics. So that particular student may have to use his computer back, uh, background skills uh, to add uh, additional training or acquire additional training in uh, bioinformatics. Uh, you could also have a situation whereby a person is going to industry and his uh, job responsibility will be about informatics uh, programming. So that will be a very different application based uh, uh, compared to a person who may just be interested in working in the biomedical center doing microarray data analysis and things like that. So, you know, so the skill, level, the skill set levels will also differ based on the, uh, the needs. Yeah, well, uh, that's a very good discussion. So if the audience have anything to add, uh, please post it in the uh, uh, chat box and I'll be happy to read it out uh, uh, for everyone. Um, now let's move on and then uh, go to the next question. Um, essentially, I get asked about this a lot by prospective students. And they say, well, uh, Jake, I'm really interested in getting into the field. Uh, I'm a biologist and I know a little bit of a, a just Python. I take the Coursera course and tell me what should I learn in the next uh, several months so that I can maybe get to study in the master program or PhD program. Uh, should I learn more R uh, just software engineering, or what are the essential skills? What do you think? Or they're asking the wrong questions. Uh, so I think they're actually asking the right questions and they like you. Uh, I also get a lot of those questions because as I said, a lot of our students are actually coming from uh, historically black colleges where there is no bioinformatics or anything like that. They, they are coming from the biology departments, uh, uh, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so that's the uh, kind of challenging, and that's actually that's one of the reasons why I, I went for the option of starting with the master's level uh, uh, program, uh, because uh, I just didn't believe that uh, some of the students may qualify to go to the PhD level program. So, uh, for my case, uh, the way I have structured it is such that the uh, uh, they learn a little bit of basic skills, maybe operational programs like R that they can easily learn. Uh, and then in addition to that, if they are going to come, uh, then they have foundational courses in the first semester. That's why 
I have structured it like including uh, genetics, genomics, and introductory biostatistics, and a little bit of bioinformatics programming, just to bring them to that level because they are coming from different backgrounds. So that that's so that's what we are that's what we are uh, looking we are dealing with that situation. Anyone else want to comment? Well, I think uh, for maybe CMU, this is uh, a, a question that is so trivial because uh, you are not evaluating just on the skills and even the GPA, perfect 4.0 GPA is not sufficient to qualify the student. And they have to have research skill, leadership skills, people skills, in addition to just programming skills. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say not necessarily. Okay. So we have a master's program too, or two master's programs. Uh -huh. And every year we have uh, a very non-trivial subset of students who are very strong biology undergrads who have never programmed and know that they want to do it, um, but maybe haven't even done a little bit of Coursera work. Um, and so we give them some prep material, but we it's very similar to what Chindo said. We In our first semester of that program, it's very foundational. We make them take genetics, cell and molecular biology, uh, mathematics and statistics, programming and algorithms. Um, sometimes they take the genetics course in the spring. Um, but it's very, and they're all very rigorously taught from like first principles with the idea of making sure everybody's kind of on a level playing field. So it, even the, regardless of what university you're at, sometimes it's, um, it's important to, to do those sorts of things. And if you, if you're not assuming that background. Um, I'm, I'm also seeing a comment from the audience. Uh, cell biology, molecular biology, quantitative biology, statistics, and basic programming knowledge are required skills to get into this field. Um, I, I like the, uh, the, very, the breadth of the requirement. Um, in reality, though, I'm seeing that uh, a lot of the students are coming into the program expecting to strengthen many of the skills. Uh, wouldn't you say, Elliot? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's why you're a student, to pick up all of these skills. <laughs> now, having said that, you have to come in with, with some realization of what the reality is going to be. That is, if you are in a program that's heavily quantitatively oriented and you don't yet have those quantitative skills, you might have to do some remedial work, maybe take some classes that's going to take away a bit of the time that you would have for other classes. And so it may take time to get up to speed to the level needed for the program you're getting into. But suffice it to say, you're a student. So, you know, you're expected not to have all of the skills that you need right off the bat. Yeah. Well, great discussion. I would like to add that uh, this may be very personalized question and that this requires some consultation time. Uh, Anyone interested probably need a, a faculty mentor or senior uh, bioinformatician who have been there, done that, and look at the, the person's current resume and the courses taken and do chart out maybe a personalized path to get uh, to, the, uh, to the beginning. And they may not be just a you know, one size fit all type of a solution. Okay, so if we're uh, happy with the discussion so far, let's uh, just move on and say a student already into uh, our take uh, just in our program, taken all the basic courses. At UAB, the basic courses are Info 701, Introduction to Bioinformatics, that talk uh, mostly. Uh, computational biology, sequence, structure, function, type of bioinformatics. And 702 is uh, um, designed to be algorithm in bioinformatics based on Phillips and uh, Pre Pavel Pres uh, uh, Presner's uh, book. Um, and then uh, 703 is uh, biological data management. They, they learn how to uh, structure biological data, uh, and then uh, using relational, object relational, uh, big data database to do querying. Uh, 704 is an NGS. And beyond that, and uh, I think uh, 
um, then there will be a, a wide variety of elective courses. But then this is where student could potentially get confused. Uh, the advisor may say, okay, you need to take uh, more biology courses, where the student think that he really wants to take more machine learning courses. Well, what advice do you give to the student uh, that he need to really balance his own needs or listen to his advisor? Only because I have to leave, I'm gonna give my last two words okay. and answer to your question. Okay. It's statistics. Okay. Any rationale behind it? I mean, bioinformatics these days is statistics in, in many ways. And so I think you need a firm grounding in statistics and it wouldn't hurt to go beyond just the regular biostats course that everyone has to take anyway. Um, so, you know, if you're looking for an elective, that's not a bad way to go. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Elliot. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. Uh, Chindo, so you have some comments? Uh, yeah, actually, I agree with that because uh, when I was uh, uh, when I was designing this program here, that's what I had to look at. First, I had to look at what do we have and what can we offer at the medical center. We do not have the structure that, for example, UAB has, like computer science and other uh, courses. So that's part of the reason why I integrated some of our statistics courses into the program. And that also gives the students that in addition to the two required biostatistics courses, if they want to take a more advanced biostatistics, say, for example, Bayesian statistics, the probability statistics, that they can stay, still take that as those as options. Great. Any thoughts, uh, Philip? Yeah, I think that's, that's great sentiments. I think machine learning should be required because it's it's integrally tied to statistics in the same sense. Um, but for all our programs, we require, we require students to take advanced coursework in ML and math and biology, as well as some comp bio electives. So um, I think a combination of all of those is good. Yeah, so uh, I'm just gonna elaborate a little bit more from that. In the biostatistics uh, PhD program, they have a very course heavy load almost leaving very little room for research until the last year of their five-year PhD. Uh, do you think that the bioinformatics program should be run like that, to be course after course, or more like a, a traditional life science PhD program where research-based learning is a priority and uh, the courses are probably optional and uh, you think the student can learn on the job and when they're really deficient and take the course or two? Yeah, so uh, so that is exactly what you just said is uh, how we designed this one here. We created a balance between the research and the experience and the, the courses. So it's uh, we strike a balance between how many courses the students can take that are mandatory, uh, but also to leave a sufficient time for them to pursue uh, a research project, which actually starts in, in the second year, I mean, in the second semester and goes all the way up to the last semester, which is uh, in the second year. So uh, because of exactly what you said, because if the student just takes courses, but they do not really experience the real world, then that can be very difficult for them to succeed when they graduate. All right. Great. Steve, Steve Vance here. Uh, I see Yui Mathi is on the call. And maybe Yui like, would like to talk about uh, wet, dry, and the bridge between. Um, she ran a, a workshop at our mass spectrometry meeting in the last time we met together in 2019. And a lot of it was about mutual respect between the communities. And I think it's like anything else. If you understand a little bit about the people you work with, you're, you are more effective because you open the communication between two often diff very different disciplines. But in our case, it was mass spectrometry and, uh, and all of the um, 
things that you're doing in informatics and computing. Um, yeah, yeah, so and, welcome. And, that, and, that, yeah. Should be a, and that, that probably should be a small bridge, but it was still there. Um, maybe, maybe Yui would like to comment if she's uh, listening in. Yeah, I, I am listening in. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, this is, this is something that's always, that we're always trying to achieve. And I think one of the interesting aspects is uh, here in the environment at NCAST. Let me back up a little bit. So I, I, I was at Ohio State University for about five years. And about 13 months ago, I joined uh, NCATS at the NIH. And one of the interesting, and I'm in the intramural program, and one of the interesting aspects is that a lot of the work being done in my current environment involve teams, and the teams are built to have representation from biology, chemistry, and informatics. And, um, and, and this is very kind of consistent, right, uh, throughout NCATS. And I think it helps bridge a little bit some of these silos and just increases the understanding of what the challenges are within each. And, uh, and one, one interesting observation from all of this is how much, uh, how much shared challenges there are between informatics and chemistry in terms of this multidisciplinary application uh, and, and, and the broad aspect, right? Because in informatics or, you know, whether it's bioinformatics or comp bio, um, you may not be attached to a particular biological system or to a particular disease system, right? Your, your methodology or the way you apply the software, the methods could be applied in a, in a very broad spectrum, but that's a very different viewpoint if you're, if, if you're a biologist. And I think chemistry, it's, it's quite similar because the, the tools in analytical or, or, or organic chemistry that are being applied can be applied in a wide variety of applications. And so I think whatever can be done on a training perspective for the students to be sure that they're not siloed and that they, they get these kind of broad application experiences would be very helpful on the ground in, in, in their research experiences later. Yeah, very nice comment. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Steve. Yeah. So this actually transitioned very nicely. We're talking about the bioinformatics being highly interdisciplinary and uh, demanding all kinds of skills. Um, perhaps for, it's easier to make a decision for undergraduate uh, trainee in bioinformatics to stay focused on knowledge acquisition. But for more uh, late stage trainees at the graduate level, especially at the PhD level, uh, don't they still face the decision whether to develop more hardcore bioinformatics algorithmic research skills versus apply the bioinformatics skills that uh, can run multiple tools and apply to a more biology problem. Which path should they take if they want to become a PhD in the field and leading, or it doesn't matter? There's a lot of silence. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, which question is this now, or number five or uh, six? Yeah, number five, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it depends on the line of research and the focus. I think one of the things that we have to address before we can just prescribe which courses or which line of research is, I think we also have to be a little bit open-minded to ask the students, what, what is their interest? What, what is their career pathways? Because a, a student who wants to say, for example, working in a biomedical center, just supporting research, uh, is very different from a student who wants to go to the industry and be doing a technology development like bioinformatics programming and things like that. So, so, so I think we have to strike a balance uh, so that the students are well informed, they just don't uh, uh, acquire the skills that do not match with uh, their future their future goals. Yeah, very well, well said. 
Uh, Philip, so what's the situation in CMU? I mean, we, we tend to try and, and educate students more on the side of, of having this very strong computational foundation. And I think that that bears out well in terms of their, say, salaries within industry. I think there's kind of more of an industry demand for that sort of thing. But I think there's great value in both. I'm kind of more interested really in the what to me seems like the fundamental educational challenge, which is how do we bridge computational biology between training people who are computationally quantitatively minded first and foremost to people who are more scientifically biologically minded um so it's cool to hear from yui about you know the sort of thing that uh you know the, the organizing students in in groups and so on um to to bridge that gap but i i think the the gap between these two areas is more are, are you a computational biologist or are you more of a biologist who is, um, you know, training yourself in a modern way? Um, and I think there's excellent opportunities to build a bridge between those two types of people, but unfortunately we don't have so much of that as a field. It's, I yeah. think it's better than what it was, but it, we're, we're still miles from, from where we would like to be. Right, I, and I think I agree with uh, what Philip just said because uh, some of these things are also technology driven because I remember when we were doing bioinformatics 10, 20 years ago, it was bioinformatics, but you see now there are emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning also has taken it uh, another level like deep learning and things like that. Uh, so, so that then requires uh, some specialized skills because if a student uh, uh, is going to be trained in bioinformatics and is going to go in the direction of machine learning and artificial intelligence. That is a little bit more heavy lifting than just a student who is just going to be analyzing RNA-seq data and things like that. Okay, good. Well, moving on to the next question is uh, the, uh, the kind of a jobs available. Uh, so most students would like to know that whether there will be number one jobs within the industry, bioinformatic industry itself. It seems that in our field, uh, a lot of the master level jobs are absorbed by research institute, universities, and some biotech companies. The PhD, there are not many faculty positions. Uh, so what, what do you think is uh, the, the type of jobs that, that your graduate or graduate from your program have gone to and uh, what kind of advice you can tell them? Is this a really attractive uh, career path to get uh, exciting jobs? Or it's uh, really interesting at school, but uh, not much hope once you're out of the school. Like, uh, I don't mean any, in any derogative way, but uh, let's say Greek language. <laughs> Well, I, I think, Jake, the other thing in terms of demand, the traditionally, the traditional one that actually has the lowest starting salaries at the undergrad level is biology. And that's kind of a dark secret. But even at very prestigious universities, students with biology degrees, if they're not pre-medical, the supply of biology majors is so much higher um, than the demand for within industry that the starting salaries are comparable to classic studies and art history and things like that, which is, again, that's not... Um, to say that it's not a valid field of study, but it's, I think that that's relevant to know. Um, we don't have, that having been said, we don't have any problem placing our students. Um, even in a master's program with 25 to 35 students per year, um, we have 100% job placement. And some, you know, some students will go to tech jobs for sure, um, often because they're so well paid, but we have pretty good retention, especially of late. Uh, sending students to big pharma firms, small pharma firms, you know, biotech places of all different sizes, uh, startups that, you know, it's, it's hard to track. There are literally hundreds of startups per year um, if you take a broad view of, of computation for life sciences, as well as the sort of things you mentioned, university hospitals, research institutes, contract research places, and so on. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't typically have a problem at all with, with job placement of grads. The one thing I would say is, is we try to make sure that when we've had grads who have moved on to something else, it's when um, the appearance versus the reality of what they do at certain types of firms is that they actually are being asked to just do off the shelf 
bioinformatic software analyses use standard pipelines, whereas they've been trained to do much more and, and be more, you know, scientifically, you know, computer scientists, so to speak. Um, and so we try to make sure that they, they head in directions of places that will be, allow them to use those abilities. Thank you. So the last question I have here is really related to my hypothesis, why there are more females than males. So I've talked to a lot of the uh, students who I try to lure from computer science into uh, bioinformatics. And they said, well, I'm looking at the jobs. Uh, if I come into a master program in data science and I get a higher job than uh, going into bioinformatics. In bioinformatics, I like it, but somehow I also have to learn biology. I don't have that time or patience. So I can learn one subject at higher paying salary. Why should I care about bioinformatics? And perhaps those students who are female are more patient and thinking longer term <laughs> than shorter term. But uh, I'd like to hear everyone, so including the people in the audience, and we can finish off in the next uh, two minutes. Jake, one, one uh, last thing from my long experience. Um, I, I think of myself as being very mathematic and arithmetic oriented. I go to college and I take a degree in statistics and it was the most boring course I ever met. Uh, I then went out and did science for about 10 years. And then when I came to UAB, I, I got into the master's biostatistics program and it was wonderful. And so why? It's because uh, the work, the teaching was put into context. And so, uh, if, if we're going to bridge these gaps between different communities, um, the examples from one community should, should be uh, flowed over into the others. In other words, you don't, you don't do machine learning on something if you're trying to bring in people who have a bioinformatics or a biological background. Make it context relevant because all of a sudden it's easier to teach. I find that generally in teaching if you're teaching a class and they all look sort of blank at you, it's because you're not getting into their minds. And so you have to find a way to, so you, in other words, you, you, if you're gonna teach computing to biologists, you can't use the same methodologies that you have for teaching computing students who want to be computing students. Just, just something that is hard to do because the teacher has to be um, a bridge aware person. Thank you. Uh, anyone want to take the last comment? Maybe uh, Ron, Robin, Phillips, and Chindo? I mean, I can make a very quick comment. I'll leave to someone else. I don't think we should try and, and attract a student who wants to, to do these other fields. I, don't, I think we have a, a wonderful field and maybe it has a slightly lower pay than something like selling ads for Facebook or training Uber cars to crash into each other. I could not care less. And there's a huge bubble there. And many people who actually don't know what these fields are truly about who get into them for the salaries. And I would hate for our field to become that. So um, I love that all of our students actually want to do what they're doing. I think it's a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with uh, Philip because even if a person is very good at uh, cybersecurity and all of that, but you know, if you wanted to do cybersecurity on the biological data or biological systems, you may want to at least learn a little bit about uh, what that is about, even still preserving your cybersecurity knowledge. All right, well, uh, I think with that, uh, let's thank all our panelists uh, Phillips, Chindo, uh, and uh, Elliot for their wonderful uh, just uh, insight uh, to share at the uh, in the past an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you all.